Good morning. I'm Bobby Chesney. I'm the director of the Strauss Center for International Security and Law here at the University of Texas. On behalf of my colleague, Will Inboden, director of the Clement Center for National Security, and Steve Slick, director of the Intelligence Studies Project, we're very happy to have you all here on UT's campus to talk about something that is we knew it would be timely when we organized the panel, but I don't think, frankly, we appreciated just how timely it would be. As I'm speaking, Americans in Brussels, Belgium, are under orders to shelter in place because of expectations of a possible imminent attack. Yesterday, as no doubt you all know, uh, an American citizen, Anitra Dutra, died, um, killed in the hotel raid in Bamako, Mali, along with many, many others. Um, in an attack that in some ways has begun to seem a, a familiar pattern. Obviously, previously on Friday, we had the, the outrages in Paris. There's a drip, drip, drip of events of this kind going on. And, and what I've mentioned only really emphasizes the stuff that catches Americans' attention in particular. Uh, it would be wrong not to mention as well the downing of the Russian Metrojet out of Sharm el-Sheikh, the, the bombings in uh, Beirut. Uh, the several bombings yesterday in Baghdad. In some ways, it seems just another day, another set of headlines. And yet, when I was getting my coffee this morning, the, the coffee that they didn't let me bring in here, so if I get sleepy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Um, now, I've got, now that I have your attention, I, I picked up the Times, um, which is still being printed, and it, it, everything above the fold, it's all about this. Uh, police step up, terror battle in New York. Uh, comments about Trump's comments on, on Muslims. Uh, Paris and Mali attacks expose a lethal Al-Qaeda-ISIS rivalry. Deadly siege ends after an assault on a Mali hotel. It could be like this every day. It's been like this for a long time. But of course, these aren't novel 2015 developments, and they're not novel post-2001 developments or post-9-11 developments either. This is a situation, uh, what the chancellor yesterday referred to as, as barbarism against civilization. It's a situation that's been unfolding for a very long time, including in its modern manifestation as terrorism of the kind I just described. We have an exceptional panel this morning to talk about these issues. Um, our format's gonna be a little different than uh, prior panels at this conference, in this case, we're going to strive for more of a conversational, mutual engagement, sort of more of a talk show format, if you will. Um, I am going to give an exceptionally short introduction to each one of them. I hope everyone grabbed the full biography sheets out front. I suspect that most of you already know a lot about these, these gentlemen because they, they truly are um, the, the best of the best from across fields of intelligence, uniformed military, civilian oversight of the military, academia, the State Department. It's, it's exactly who I would have liked to have spent time with to talk about these recent events. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to have the chance to uh, instigate a conversation with them. Uh, very briefly, we have Dan Benjamin, formerly the State Department Coordinator for Counterterrorism. We have Bruce Hoffman, by anyone's measure, the Dean of Academics who study terrorism and counterterrorism. Lieutenant General Frank Kisner, um, formerly the NATO Special Operations Commander. John McLaughlin, former Deputy Director of Central Intelligence. Mike Vickers, former Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and previously for SOLIC as well. Let's start, gentlemen, um, by going back chronologically a bit. Let's, let's go back to talk about Al-Qaeda in particular, and let's talk about Al-Qaeda early on, around 2001. Um, I'd, I'd be grateful to hear your uh, overview of what Al-Qaeda was aiming to achieve strategically and, and how that led it to begin targeting U.S. persons and U.S. interests both abroad and in the homeland. Um, and I, I throw it open to who, whoever might wish to address that first. Dan, perhaps you? Well, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the uh, brief introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, the Clement Center and the Strauss Center and uh, UT more broadly. Um, as I think most people know, the uh, Al-Qaeda's big innovation strategically uh, was to um, reorient the jihadist movement away from attacking as it had really going back to at least the 60s, from attacking uh, the regional governments, uh, the Arab, primarily the Arab governments, 
that they deemed uh, apostate and reorienting it, uh, the struggle towards uh, the United States, or as they called it, the far enemy. Uh, and the idea behind this was that, uh, that the uh, Mujahideen had shown that they were incapable of toppling the Muhabarat state, the secret, uh, the secret uh, intelligence state um, of, the, uh, of the Arab world, and that if they hit the United States hard enough, the United States would uh, withdraw from uh, the Middle East, uh, and that uh, it would then be a lot easier to, um, uh, to topple those regimes. It would also uh, be an electrifying event that would cause uh, many believers to suddenly gravitate to, uh, to uh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda's cause and to acknowledge bin Laden's leadership of uh, international jihadism. And so that was uh, the thinking. It was also the thinking behind the particular kinds of uh, attacks that they embraced, which uh, were meant to be uh, as spectacular as was feasible, um, and uh, which caused uh, you know, indiscriminate violence and the largest possible numbers of uh, casualties. Would anyone like to add to that, and perhaps comment on the role that the significance of safe havens and the question maybe in the period prior to 9-11, what was the significance of Al-Qaeda having a uh, protected territorial base from which to train and operate? Well, it, it was very uh, significant. Uh, reflecting on what Dan just said, I'm trying to think of the uh, one point when people were uh, mistakenly talking about Al-Qaeda having been uh, strategically defeated. It made me think back, I think that was an error, but it made me think back to that period. Um, like Al-Qaeda first came on our screen in the 90s at CIA, and particularly about 1996 when we saw uh, bin Laden in Sudan as a financier of terrorism. Uh, the real, uh, when this came sharply into focus was in 1998 when Al-Qaeda carried out the attacks on our embassies in Africa, uh, and then in 2000 when they attacked the USS warship, the Coles, Coles, uh, uh, in Yemen. So it was apparent to us uh, in 1996 when he moved from Sudan to Afghanistan that uh, gradually it became clear that that was turning into a safe haven to go to uh, Bobby's question. And it was from there uh, that those attacks that I just mentioned were probably planned and masterminded, um, although carried out elsewhere. So the, the fact of a safe haven was very important. Um, and it tells you something about the difference between 9-11, pre-9-11, and, and post-9-11, in that uh, we knew uh, prior to 9-11 that that's where bin Laden was, and that's where al-Qaeda was. Uh, remember, it's in uh, roughly, it's in the year 2000 that we developed the capability to fly a, an unarmed drone over al-Qaeda, and it's in that year, I believe, maybe a early 2001 or in, two, I think it's in 2000 that we see someone we believe to be Al-Qaeda, uh, be, believe to be bin Laden, a uh, tall, thin man in a white robe surrounded by a security detail, what looks like a security detail. And that's all in Afghanistan. So um, as 9-11 approaches, the importance of that safe haven grows. Of course, we don't know that the specific event of 9-11 is about to happen, even though we had a lot of strategic warning of an attack prior to 9-11. Um, one could say retrospectively that everyone should have gone into that safe haven before 9-11, but it's a little bit like the conversation we had on cyber the other day when someone said, we have not yet had the clarifying event that brings into focus what cyber is for everyone. I think 9-11 was that clarifying event in, in terrorism because literally within a week between September 11 and September 17, um, the president made the decision we were going in there. So that the safe haven became, you know, it became, we were aware of it, it gradually grew in importance. 9-11 brought it into focus and uh, the rest is history, you know. Let me add to the, um, 
safe havens are um, critical to these kinds of planning. So if you look at the evolution of these groups over the last 20 years, as, the, as John mentioned, the safe haven in Afghanistan, but whenever counterterrorism pressure has um, uh, relaxed a bit. So after 9-11, Al-Qaeda first went into the settled areas of Pakistan and then settled into the Fatah. For a few years in the Fatah, they were relatively uh, unmolested, and that's how we got the transatlantic airliner plot of, of 2006, where they wanted to blow up 10 airliners uh, over the uh, uh, Atlantic that was broken up by good intelligence work. See the same periodically, you know, even for shorter periods when pressure has been off on them for, say, a couple months for a variety of reasons, um, they start planning again and gathering. We've seen the same thing in Yemen. Yep. The threat in Syria got very, very high right before um, we started engaging uh, in Syria. So there were a lot of threats emanating out of Syria in um, uh, summer spring and summer of 2014 before the uh, U.S. and an allied campaign started there. I think from, a, um, from another perspective, it's no coincidence that the day before we experienced 9-11, the charismatic leader of the Northern Alliance, Massoud, was killed. And if you look at the understanding that, or expectation that the United States may respond, and what would we do? We would look to anybody that we could identify as a partner or ally in the region and to turn around and, and attack the leader of the Northern Alliance to uh, set them off balance at the same time that we were getting struck in America, I, I think that uh, arguably there was an understanding on the part of Al-Qaeda how important their safe haven was as well. I mean, I think two things. Uh, firstly, uh, the, I think the, the nexus between sanctuary and safe haven and what happened on 9-11 is entirely significant because Really, with the 9-11 attacks, terrorism crossed the threshold and went from something that was relatively sporadic, more or less infrequent, uh, was a tragic nuisance, to something that posed, I think, serious strategic, that had serious strategic consequences, really, for the first time. And I think that all comes back to terrorists having um, access to sanctuary and safe haven. 30 years ago, uh, Margaret Thatcher said that Publicity was the oxygen that terrorists depend upon, but I think what Al-Qaeda really showed in that era is that access to sanctuary and haven, and even more so today, is the oxygen that terrorists depend upon. And lastly, what made that sanctuary and safe haven so consequential and elevated its strategic threat was that we know for a fact now, in retrospect, uh, that Al-Qaeda was moving towards development of various types of weapons of mass destruction, that it had competing biological and chemical weapons, uh, product, uh, research and development that were highly compartmented, going on at multiple facilities, competing with one another. They even had, I mean, they were not even in the half-baked realm, but in the quarter-baked realm, nuclear ambitions. But I think having that space and having that opportunity to set up these research and development arms made the sanctuary and safe haven appear something much more threatening than terrorism had ever been before. Just to add a, uh, uh, a point to what Bruce just said, uh, I'm recalling now that when we went into the safe haven after 9-11, uh, two things of note, uh, many things of note, but two things that stand out in my mind. We did find a rudimentary anthrax lab laboratory. Uh, we didn't know at that point. You have to get back into the atmosphere of those times, which m many people have forgotten. But we didn't know at that point how far along they were in the program or if they were along in it at all. But we knew they were doing work on it from the forensics that we did uh, in this laboratory that we discovered. Later, we discovered that, in fact, they, they had a lot of help on this from, uh, among others, a person named Yasid Sufat in, um, in uh, Malaysia. Um, second big thing that I recall is we had absolutely uh, clear uh, indication, evidence, that uh, bin Laden had met in that sanctuary with two Pakistani nuclear scientists. And uh, w again, we didn't know what had he discussed. Uh, we, Learned this through documents and through talking to people there. Eventually, uh, George Tenet went to Pakistan and uh, confronted then President Musharraf with that knowledge and said, we need to know uh, what went on in that conversation. You need to find these two Pakistani nuclear scientists and find out what was discussed. And to his credit, Musharraf did that. And, uh, what we learned was that uh, they had had a discussion along the lines of 
Um, what do I need for a nuclear weapon? How would I put it together? We had found a crude, you know, the sort of thing I might draw <laughs> if I were drawing uh, an explosive device, a kind of crude scientific diagram. Um, and uh, as I recall, the scientist said to him, you, you know that the long pole in the tent is uh, nuclear explosive material, fissile material. And he was alleged to have said, how do you know I don't already have it? So that was the atmosphere of those times. Th th that was the, what we were working with, that kind of, uh, imagine that coming into today's atmosphere. Um, yeah. If I can just um, add a comment to what both John and, and Bruce have said, since I know there are a fair number of students who uh, were, were not around in those days, or at least not sentient. Um, <laughs> I hope. Um, we did actually have a fair amount of intelligence about uh, bin Laden's efforts to uh, create uh, unconventional weapons. Uh, we thought we had very good uh, intelligence on uh, his efforts to create chemical weapons, and that led to the targeting of Sudan in 1998. We don't have to rehearse the entire controversy, but the, the intelligence was, uh, you know, it was pretty solid as far as the White House was concerned. At some point, there was also intelligence developed that uh, bin Laden had, uh, or his uh, agents had tried to buy what they thought was fissile material. It turned out to be a scam, uh, but they really were uh, quite serious about this. Now, the flip side of that was even though this intelligence was circulating uh, in the U.S. government and, and obviously, you know, compartmented, um, compartmented levels, um, the belief uh, was so ingrained that terrorism was a third tier uh, concern as a security matter uh, that it was very hard to really motivate uh, the bureaucracy to take it more seriously and to get people to kind of step out of the paradigm that they were in and to think that in fact there could be strategic damage done by a terrorist attack. And, uh, um, you know, the U.S. government and, and especially the security uh, uh, component of it is truly an aircraft carrier and it takes quite a lot to turn it around. But there were extensive discussions uh, with the Pentagon about having a, uh, um, a mission into uh, Afghanistan to uh, destroy the sanctuary. And uh, they were inconclusive. Uh, the White House wasn't happy that the Pentagon kept coming back with um, uh, uh, plans that, uh, as Tom Pickering would later characterize them, were sort of the gold-plated invasion uh, version, two divisions, uh, you know, nothing less. And so, um, and really all around the, the, uh, the community, there just was not a feeling that this was real. We'd heard about terrorists who were interested in WMD before, although none who had really pursued it. And uh, so it, it really was a different era. Uh, and uh, I don't think that should be, ever be forgotten in terms of, uh, you know, what the mindset was. You know, picking up on that remark, um, we have the benefit of hindsight now. It, without the benefit of hindsight, people in the 1990s and into 2000, 2001 had to ponder what, if anything, should we be doing in Afghanistan to deal with al-Qaeda and its safe haven. And it, in some ways, the, the debate Dan just referenced resonated with 1980s debates between Cap Weinberger and George Schultz about whether and to what extent to use military force, well, targeted or otherwise, uh, in response to Hezbollah in particular. I was wondering if uh, maybe Mike, you and Frank could comment on the, the general, especially post-Vietnam, reluctance of the military in the 1980s and perhaps into the 90s uh, to be used for these sorts of missions, perhaps you know, bearing in mind the Powell Doctrine about using the military when you use overwhelming force with clear missions, clear support, and so forth. Can you comment on what that atmosphere was like and why it perhaps is a relevant consideration to bear in mind in later years uh, when we also think about uh, interventions with military force? Uh, sure. Well, uh, Dan mentioned one problem, which was, um, you know, to deal with the sanctuary, it was either all or nothing rather than, you know, a variety of force options uh, um, pre-9-11. Um, but also, we really didn't have the um, capabilities going into 9-11 that we would later need, or the posture. So we had very exquisite counterterrorism forces, but they were really designed for um, episodic, uh, short-duration missions. You know, if we had hostages taken somewhere, we would plan to rescue them, 
we would do that once in a while. Not a sustained campaign as we then found ourselves in where we had to build this, as uh, Bill McRaven said yesterday, a network to fight a network. Um, we did not have the, um, uh, John mentioned the um, uh, drones or Predator and Reaper UAVs. Um, we didn't have those, and so it took us a decade to really build those up to develop the capability to provide the surveillance and precision strike um, that we needed. And so uh, it was both a function of policy and capabilities that, that uh, took us a while to, to adapt to this. And, you know, as Bruce said, to really take this seriously as a strategic threat. Yeah. I, I would add to what uh, Mike said. There was also a uh, an attitudinal issue, and that is that the... Uh, the Joint Chiefs, I mean, the senior most military, uh, I think viewed special operations at that time as, uh, you know, something bordering on folly. That they were really, really worried that if you'd send out uh, the, um, the special operators to do something, the chances of something going wrong were simply too high. They had very much had Desert One on the brain. And... Um, I, I mention that and I underscore it um, because we have gone through a revolution. I know I'm not supposed to jump ahead, but um, we, you know, we have had an, a, a complete revolution in uh, the American way of warfare, and uh, the, um, you know, there were there were a number of different authors of this uh, revolution, and uh, necessity is probably the foremost one, uh, but certainly Bill McRaven and uh, and Stan McChrystal were the two people who probably uh, deserve as much uh, credit for that as, uh, as anyone. Uh, but it's an entirely different world when it comes to how we use the military now. I, I think one of the important um, facts, if you will, to turn around and look at a, a study of uh, Desert One, a study of the events uh, of a failed uh, rescue mission, actually revamped uh, the special operations community, certainly the, uh, the counterterrorism side of it. But the way that we trained throughout the 80s, <clears throat> the capabilities that we brought on board, the number of missions, scenarios that we came up with, Frank Kissner and then Major Mick Bednarik and the Ranger Regiment spent numerous times, three, four-week sessions, where we would turn around and come and build similar type scenarios as Desert One to make sure that we got it right this time around, to look at what the missions were. If you look at the revamp of the United States uh, Army Special Operations Aviation Regiment, and look at the 160 it did then and what they do now. Uh, Air Force uh, Special Operations Command, certainly. But the ability of Rangers and Special Mission Units to work and integrate together really started through that time of the uh, 80s uh, and then early 90s and, and came to that, and I hesitate to say, hesitate to say nascent capability, um, but it goes without saying that we have evolved tremendously uh, since 2001. But that all came about because Congress got involved. It all came about because the Holloway Commission uh, assessed what needed to be done. And in fact, we had a revamp. Secretary of Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict was a result of that to ensure that there was Department of Defense oversight because there was the belief, as was stated, that this was a low-end force that the Department of Defense maybe shouldn't uh, have to put as much emphasis on as they do now. So that entire two decades of buildup to it really set the stage for the forces that went in in 2001, and then we look at 14 years of revamp. But a reminder as we go back, it really took Congress an active involvement to create an oversight of the special operations community to bring that post-Vietnam uh, capability back to play. Let me mention a little history relating to this and maybe an anecdote that illustrates it. Uh, thinking back on that period, because, uh, Bobby, you asked about pre-9-11. So um, you heard my history of how the CIA gradually became aware of and focused on bin Laden. Uh, it's in 1996 that we form a special unit within the CIA to look exclusively at bin Laden. So we're looking at him throughout this period. It's in the Clinton administration that the attacks on our embassy and the USS Cole occur, the Cole near the end of the Clinton administration. The, um, and by the way, when people try to assign blame, if you will, for, to these two administrations, Clinton and Bush, uh, as someone who was there at the uh, intersection of them, I, I gotta tell you, both worked hard on terrorism. And uh, 
they both ran out of time, is the way I always put it. In any event, in the Clinton administration, uh, because of those attacks, uh, they were obsessed, particularly in the latter part of the Clinton administration, with bin Laden and with al-Qaeda. And in the last year, perhaps in the last six months of Clinton, uh, Sandy Berger, uh, then the National Security Advisor, asked us for a memo every single day, uh, maybe we didn't do it on Sunday, on what we knew about this problem. And in the last three months or so, he said, I want you to put together what he called a blue sky plan for how we would attack al-Qaeda uh, and end this problem. And by blue sky, he meant unconstrained by resources. Just tell me what you have to do. And so we did that. I remember sitting in my basement with my dog. <laughs> uh, the dog did not have input. <laughs> but, you know, and there's, we had a crude uh, um, secure fax, and I would be faxing this back and forth to various people, principally uh, a fellow named Kofer Black, who may be known to many of you. And we, we ended up with a plan. But the Clinton administration ran out of time. Pure and simple. They, I mean, they didn't even have time then to actually look at that plan and deliberate on it and look at it from a practical point of view. Uh, the Bush administration comes in, and every administration that I've ever worked for takes a few months to review everything and figure out where they want to be on all of these issues. And, and they did that, and to their, you know, to their credit, I would say through the summer of 2001, without knowledge that this was going to happen on September 11, uh, they convened meetings to discuss what to do about al-Qaeda. And uh, these were very intense meetings. If you want later, I can take you through all the subjects discussed. But uh, their last pr meeting of principles, that is the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and so forth, was held on September 4. And at that meeting, they were coming close to decisions on key deployment issues. And uh, the meeting ended with, uh, well, we'll get back together. And seven days, 9-11 happens. And then from then on, the decision making is rapid. And almost, uh, it, it, it turned, it, from that point on, it's uh, bang, bang, bang. Everything just happens at once. Uh, decisions are made in minutes that would have been made in days or weeks before. And uh, the whole thing unfurls. Now, the anecdote. Uh, when the president instructs us on September 17, this is to go to the point of the, the growing, the, the, the relationship that, when I talk about how the CIA has changed in the last 12 to 14 years, uh, among the four or five points I would mention is a, an incredibly close and productive integration with the military. I mean, it's astonishing. It, it is a treasured uh, capability that our country has now to integrate civilian intelligence with military power. And I hope we never lose it. Um, but it took that time. So we're in the White House Situation Room, and the President, a couple days before, at September 17, Monday, in the Cabinet Room, had given everyone orders. And our orders were to get some teams into Afghanistan, which we did, two teams, 15 days after 9-11. Long story there, but we had sources on the ground. We had been cultivating the Northern Alliance. There were people there ready to receive us. We had old uh, Soviet choppers we could slip in on and so forth. And the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs, a wonderful guy, uh, was reflecting on how we were going to integrate special forces and, and CIA officers on the ground in Afghanistan. And I remember him scratching his head and saying, what are we going to do about uniforms? Because if we don't wear uniforms, we, we're not soldiers, and we don't have the Geneva Convention protections. That's the kind of fundamental question that shows you how, how far away we were in terms of thinking together about this. I mean, it's, it's a misleading anecdote, because everyone was proceeding with the, the best of will and a, a desire to cooperate, and all the barriers were down. But we were feeling our way. Of course, after these teams went in, no one thought about that at all. It, uh, they all looked alike. They were all riding around on horses, and uh, CIA officers were handing out intelligence. Special Forces officers were designating targets, and Kabul fell by November. 
So we've talked a fair amount up to this point about the, uh, the evolution that various government institutions uh, went through, which is an important part of the story, but there's another important part of the story from that same period we haven't, I think, adequately talked about yet, and that is understanding a little bit more about how Al-Qaeda related to the, to the larger threat environment, and, and more specifically, how Al-Qaeda was trying to position itself in relation to a broader Salafist extremist movement. And Bruce, I was hoping you might be able to comment a bit on um, where was Al-Qaeda in relation to that broader movement? What was it trying to be in relation to that broader movement? And um, what's the right way to think about Al-Qaeda at that time, at this sort of starting point in our discussion? Well, certainly after 9-11, Al-Qaeda was desperate to survive. And I think that it underwent a transformation to ensure its longevity, which was, in essence, to move from being what had more or less been a hierarchically structured organization to something that became much more flatter and linear, that devolved authority to franchises, to affiliates and associates. And I, I would argue this has proven absolutely pivotal in enabling al-Qaeda to still exist today and to have to have withstood what, you know, after all, is you know, the greatest onslaught ever directed against the terrorist movement in the history of mankind. And it was, and I mean, I don't want to leap too far ahead to the present, but this is what has astonished me in recent years, or certainly months, with ISIS, as ISIS has been following a very similar game plan with its branches in villiettes or provinces. And, you know, the fact that, I mean, Al-Qaeda internationalized and became far more diffuse and far more diverse, trading some of its, uh, its, its top-down control. And, you know, it just it strikes me as remarkable that we didn't anticipate the exact same process was going to happen mm -hmm. with ISIS, that its branches and, and villiettes would internationalize it and give it very different capabilities, such as we've seen in the Sinai and also in Paris. How, how much of this diffusion into, into uh, a looser, flatter structure is strategic choice by both al-Qaeda then and, and ISIS now, and how much of it is forced upon them by the pressure we've placed on the network? Well, it was, it was both, because after all, the name al-Qaeda means the foundation or the base. It, al it always saw itself as an ideology or as an enabling, radicalizing agent. But at the same time, that didn't exclude the potentiality that it also undertook very specific, very directed terrorist operations. So it mixed and matched approaches, and I think it's precisely that flexibility that has given it the longevity, unfortunately, we see today. I mean, after all, Al-Qaeda was founded in 1988. I mean, one way or another, it's existed more than a quarter of a century. Terrorist groups, I don't think, can last that long unless they don't demonstrate, firstly, that they're learning organizations, that they can compensate at least to survive even the most consequential countermeasures directed against them, but that they do have this flexibility and adaptiveness. So it was a bit of both. I would argue it was always in their DNA. But I think strategically, Bin Laden and Zawahiri understood after 9-11 that for, especially around the 2003, probably 2004 or 5 period, to survive, it had to diversify. Dan? I would just add to that, I think that catches, I don't know if we want to call that the push or the pull, but there is another side, and that is, you know, there, there, have, there are and there have been jihadist groups in many different countries for many, many years. And once a group such as al-Qaeda or ISIS distinguishes itself as kind of the league leader, there's a, a big impulse uh, to rebrand and to associate with uh, that league leader. Um, and in some cases, as I think we've seen with uh, ISIS, you also see fissures within those existing groups. Some want a harder line, a harder policy, others uh, don't, and so they split, and one will rebrand itself, uh, you know, to, uh, to, with the new, with the new uh, uh, group on the block, with the new, with the new uh, league leader. So, uh, you know, it's a kind of a dynamic uh, situation out there, and, and um, I think that it's it's not the case that Al Qaeda, for example, created uh, the wide world of jihad. I think that that world was out there, and it it organized and lent uh, a lot of structure to it and a lot of direction. Uh, but the the jihadist impulse uh, has been growing globally now, you know, for 40, 50 years. There, there's a there's a pattern here, though, that's very interesting. I, I once I always recoiled against the idea that was. Uh, so popular some years ago of talking about Al-Qaeda 2.0. I always thought, no, it's actually about 4 or 5.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and for you students who are looking for a footnote, here's, here's the way I would 
uh, a way I would organize a paper. Uh, 2000, well, let's say 96, 1996 to 2001, let's call that going operational. That's when the, the big attacks occur. 2001 to 2006, I would call that Al-Qaeda classic. In other words, they do 9-11 and they go all the way up to the airline plot that Mike referred to, which had it occurred would have been another 9-11. That would have been 10 airliners coming down over the Atlantic. Thankfully, it was disrupted. 2006 to 2009, roughly, the affiliates begin to emerge. And 2009 to today, I don't know what we'd call that. We could probably have a debate here on what we call that. I would say the affiliates coalesce, communicate, and oddly, now recently, begin to compete. <laughs> in, in a look at that uh, earlier time before 2001, if you turn around and look at Zarqawi, arguably, the person who created ISIS, but in Afghanistan at the time, 1999 time frame, and even them kind of seen as a one-off from what core al-Qaeda was trying to define themselves as. And so the training camps he was associated with had the more hardliners, the, the, the absolutely more brutal attacks that we see. And that, that uh, time for him really was an assessment on the part, I think, of bin Laden of what, what do we want this guy to do? I think happy to see a Jordanian go back to uh, the, the Syrian area and now uh, go forward and create, in fact, another affiliate for uh, AQ at the time. So you've got to look at that uh, interface and really trace those threads all the way back to see who the players were and, and what they did. Let's focus on this classic Al-Qaeda phase that John was just describing and think about what we were doing that worked particularly well, at least in retrospect, and, and what didn't work so well was a mistake. I'd, I'd love to hear from all of you if there are a couple of things that stood out to you in our policy set during that period that you, know, you would say, this is something that was a smart response. That is something that, in retrospect, was a mistake. Mike, want to start down at the end? Uh, sure. I think... Um I would subdivide the period between, um, say, early 2002 and um, probably mid-2003, and then 2003 to 2007, 8 and uh, from a policy perspective, we were quite successful. As Al-Qaeda fled uh, Afghanistan and into the settled areas of Pakistan, uh, working with the Pakistanis, we uh, captured a number of them and gained a lot of... Uh, intelligence about Al-Qaeda structure and organization, and John can speak to this uh, better than I can. Um, once Al-Qaeda, then after it lost a number of leaders and it um, resettled into the federally administered tribal areas, then it became more difficult to, to get at them. Not, not impossible. And some, a lot of this was really policy changes that then President Bush would change um, late in his administration that then made our campaign a lot more effective. But that's a period where Al-Qaeda kind of regenerated, core Al-Qaeda regenerated itself. And I think, uh, 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 you know, and, and, and our risk grew up. We had a, uh, grew accordingly. We had a national intelligence estimate by 2007 that really pointed out the uh, threat to the homeland was growing pretty dramatically. And, you know, so that period, I think, was, and that also, you know, coincided a period where we were very heavily engaged in, in, in Iraq. Uh, coincidentally, the Taliban were also building up between 2003, reconstituting uh, in their Pakistani safe haven and had become a pretty serious threat by, by 2008. You know, first really in the south of Afghanistan and then later in the south and the east and then, um, President Bush at the end of his administration, and then, you know, as Dan knows and others, President Obama, or, you know, really had to deal with this uh, much bigger insurgency in Afghanistan, uh, uh, 2008 onward. Sure. Dan. So um, I will uh, talk about things not to do um, through an anecdote. Uh, I, I haven't, I've been in Texas a number of times. Um, I think the first time I was in Texas after 9-11, uh, it was around 2005 or 2006, and I was invited to be on a panel in Odessa. Um, and um, I, uh, I told, it must have been a thousand people in a, in a very large uh, auditorium or gym, and I said uh, that invading Iraq was uh, probably the biggest mistake in American foreign policy history. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> no one ran up to me and wanted to be my friend that day. That was the thing not to do. And when we think about 
sanctuaries and safe havens, we often talk about destroying them. We should also be careful not to create them uh, and not to create opportunities for uh, terrorists to uh, um, expand their operations to point to something that we've done as being confirmation of their narrative that the United States wants to uh, destroy Islam and occupy Muslim countries. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of debate about that one anymore, but that surely is an important lesson uh, going forward. Yeah, I, I'd say uh, in those early days, um, thinking back, the theme at the CIA was uh, relentless pursuit and pressure uh, on al-Qaeda. We felt um, in a way uniquely responsible uh, for protecting the country. Uh, we were simultaneously being blamed for it, uh, and that's another story. I mean, my take on that in a sentence is we gave very, very good strategic warning. Uh, you can read the 9-11 Commission report and that chapter on the lights, are, the lights were blinking red. That's our phrase uh, prior to 9-11. We did not have precise intelligence on time and target, and we failed tactically but we had given good strategic warning uh, for a variety of reasons. The country was not, uh, not, not able to operate. No, the, the, the intelligence was not operable, if you will. I don't blame anyone for not doing what, in retrospect, appears to have been logical to do. Uh, one of my friends uh, at the CIA always says, recall that very little done after 9-11 could have been done before 9-11 in terms of the political capital that our nation was prepared to, to invest in it. So it's, that's not a blame statement, that's just a statement of how things work. Think about that with regard to cyber. Um, so when 9-11 happens, I think uh, we feel doing something about it is on our shoulders initially uh, primarily because of what's been said here about what Mike said about uh, the military with all good intentions was not, um, this was not their, this is not what they thought about every day. Uh, this was what the CIA thought about every day. And so uh, it fell to us to pursue these people, find them, and uh, disrupt the networks with the assistance of the military, the Treasury Department, uh, uh, the National Security agency, all of the intelligence agencies, and, 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 and over time, the increasing involvement of uh, particularly special operations from the military side. And uh, we would have a meeting every day at 5 p.m. Uh, in our conference room, chaired by the director, <clears throat> and that meeting is somewhat legendary. Uh, uh, some people in the audience were there. Phil Mudd was there. I think Phil Mudd's written a book about it or something. But uh, that, uh, uh, <laughs> you all know Phil, obviously. Uh, but uh, it was legendary because we had everyone in the room. Uh, it's not well understood that we had senior military officers in the room. We had the National Security Agency in the room. We had the FBI in the room. And we could hear the intelligence coming in from the field from all sources, not just from our agents, but from SIGINT and overhead imagery and everything. And we could take operational decisions at that table, uh, which we would then carry out and hear about 24 hours later when we gathered at that table, but of course during the day as well. So as Mike alluded in that time, um, our, we had special uh, authorities from the president that we had never had before to go out and, and, and do some things that we had never been authorized to do before. And we went out and did them. And we basically captured the, the leadership of, nine, of, of the 9-11 era al-Qaeda. Uh, that, uh, that worked. Those capture operations were brilliant. People often forget about that in the midst of the controversy over interrogation that has ensued. Um, and I don't know whether you want to get into that. That's, that's not a fruitful field to get into. We could do the whole panel on that. But the point is, it was difficult to capture those guys. How do you capture the mastermind of 9-11, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? You don't just go out and put out a, a reward notice. You gotta find that guy. And you gotta find him through very precise intelligence. Well, we captured all those people. 
And I would say uh, that the information we received from them uh, was, for the most part, extraordinarily uh, good, solid, and effective. It led us to capture other people, to disrupt networks, and uh, now some scholars looking back at that period and all that's been published have begun to conclude that, uh, looking at what's now publicly available about the results of that, uh, of the information we received from those guys. So those were, that's what we were doing, and that's what I remember working. Following up on that, have we, do we have, have we institutionalized the capacity to coordinate in the way you just described and to develop the, uh, the manhunting intelligence necessary to be able to locate specific individuals in that way? Or is that something that existed for a moment in time? Well, in atrophy? Mike should talk about that. I haven't been in the government for a few years, uh, but my, Mike can either <laughs> confirm or or negate what I'm about to say. My sense is that's become very institutionalized. In these early days, everyone was feeling their way. I mean, it, you know, to, to, for us to get to that level often required a personal meeting, uh, which we did every two weeks, a, a sit-down lunch with Secretary Rumsfeld, to, to say, Here, here's where we are, where are you, how can we fit this together, and we gradually merge things, but I think it's probably at a level we couldn't imagine then. I mean, I'll just step aside and say uh, it's, it's, it's gone to another level. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, um, uh, you know, as John mentioned, one of the big innovations, sort of the silent innovations of the post-9-11 period is really the operational integration of the Department of Defense and, and the CIA and then the IC more broadly, but really centered on, on, on CIA. And then I would also say, uh, to Phil Mudd's help and everything else, uh, there's been a dramatic transformation in the FBI post 9-11, and the integration of domestic intelligence with foreign intelligence is, is, is just totally different than it was um, pre-9-11. Okay. Let's turn our attention to uh, the, the age of franchises, if you will, and the rise of AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Why did it emerge as such a standout amongst the, the regional threats? Um, why was it so focused or so willing to focus not just on its own local agenda, but also on out of area operations against us? Uh, maybe Bruce or Dan, either of you guys? Sure. Uh, well, I think AQAP, looking back on it, I think what makes it so interesting is that this was a group that went from soup to nuts very quickly. It was established in January 2009, and already by September, it had attempted its first major terrorist operation, which was the assassination of the then um, uh, Saudi uh, senior counterterrorist terrorist official. And by the end of its first year in existence, it presented the United States with its most formidable terrorist challenge since 9-11, which was the underwear uh, uh, bomber, uh, Abdul Farouk al-Mutalab. So it was a group that, um, Basically, it reconstituted itself from al-Qaeda's arms in the Arabian Peninsula, in Saudi Arabia, and in Yemen. Um, it had used its time when many of its key members were in prisons, in, especially in Yemen, to turn those prisons into terrorist universities where they perfected their plans, where they took advantage of persons who were released from rehabilitation programs in Saudi Arabia. In some instances, also were released from Guantanamo. Um, who unfortunately had not reformed, had not moderated their views, and brought uh, both institutional knowledge and expertise and also the street cred that enabled them to really, at a time when the core al-Qaeda was on its back foot and was being hammered from the drone attacks and from our unrelenting hunt for them, um, they became the pointy end of the spear in essence. And for a time, put al-Qaeda back on the map. And then we have in September 2010, the printer cartridges plot, you, they managed to find. I mean, this is, I think, in the history of terrorism, what's been fortunate is that there's been lots of terrorist groups and lots of terrorist incidents, but few true evil geniuses. In other words, individuals that have the capacity not just to think big, but to implement their heinous dreams, and certainly Ibrahim al-Asiri, their master bomb maker, who was responsible for the bomb that was concealed in the body of his brother that nearly killed uh, the Saudi uh, counterterrorist specialist, the underwear bomb, the printer cartridges bomb, even to this day, non-metallic uh, explosives devices that can be smuggled onto planes. And when you look in the pantheon of terrorists, it's people like Ramzi Ahmed Youssef, who tried to topple one tower onto the other in 1993. His uncle Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the architect of the World Trade Center. Marwan Krisat, 
a few others lost in the sands of time from the 1980s. But you're dealing with a small number of people with sort of the scientific expertise and the ideological fervor and commitment. And that's, I think, what's fundamentally worrisome now in the 21st century, is just because of the information revolution, just because of the broad global net that terrorist groups have been able to cast, more and more people with scientific or engineering backgrounds are going to find their way into terrorism, I think, and that'll be the next big change. And I'll stop and just say, when I first uh, joined the RAND Corporation 34 years ago as an analyst, we did a study um, for a U.S. government agency on the demographics of terrorist organizations in the 70s and 80s, and we found that the two most common occupations were teachers or university professors, which you, so, Back in that era, we didn't have a lot to worry about, being a university <laughs> professor myself, um, or medical doctors. So someone like Amin al-Zawahiri, a surgeon, shouldn't surprise us. But today what we find is people with increasingly the knowledge like al Asiri or like both Ramzi Ahmed Youssef and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who are engineers, who do have that scientific and engineering acumen. Can I interrupt, Dan, because I want to follow up on something uh, Bruce just said. Um, you just got me thinking about how in the past, you know, in, in the late 19th century with the early wave of anarchist bombings, the idea was you, you needed to find your hand, you, get, you had to get your hands on some TNT if you could and to cause a big blast. Later on, you'd have people trying to get a copy of the anarchist cookbook so they could find out how to make some, something out of some homemade materials. The internet obviously allows for diffusion of instructional technology to a considerable extent to the point that, as, as John said earlier, you know, even if within nuclear weapon, it's the fizzle material that's the, that's the long pole in the tent. It's not the actual schematics at a certain level. Um, what does, to jump ahead a little bit, what does 3D printing portend and what does the overall diffusion of technology where biologic capacities um, are going to be available to, to anybody in their home at a certain point down the road, does this give any of you guys pause from the point of view of how uh, non-state actors are going to be able to exploit things that previously were available only to states? Um, yeah, yes, I mean, the, uh, the biological side particularly. I mean, that, that field is advancing so much. Uh, no, states are doing things in that area as well. But, uh, uh, you know, as John mentioned, um, and Bruce and others about uh, Al Qaeda before 9/11. What could be done 20 years from now is is, is really scary. You know, tar targeting specific groups, uh, etc. I mean, if you look at today, what we can do with genetics in terms of disease and you know identifying ancestry. You know, there's a dark side to that science too. That I think that uh, underlying of all of that or the foundation, if you look at it, is commercial off-the-shelf technology. I mean, everything from when I look at imagery that is available today on my iPhone, it would have been classified at a level that I probably couldn't see a couple years ago. Uh, if you turn around and look at our the, the adaptability uh, of the terrorists that uh, we face now, and those who have grown up in societies that routinely use technology, uh, and, and look for new ways to exploit that technology. We have got to be so agile. The words have already been used that the enemies that we face are agile and adaptable and flexible, and obviously we need that, that same response. Uh, the director talked about the fact that you need operational intelligence to go after something, and if we are denied that operational intelligence, that sets the forces back, and we need to be very concerned about that because our enemies may have borders, but they have no boundaries of what they're looking at and doing. Yeah, you know, thinking about what, uh, what was just said, uh, we have to worry about that because going back to what Bruce's history of the um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, correct me if I'm wrong, but every one of the th these innovations that they came up with, with the exception of the cartridge bomb plot that we were tipped off to by another intelligence service, Every one of those innovations surprised us. So the, the pattern in the AQAP has been, okay, we, we, uh, we uh, or, or let's say the pattern in terrorism generally has been, okay, we detect metal getting on a plane. So what do they do? They go to, they go to liquid. We ban liquid, or we, we know to look for that. What do they do? They go to the underwear bomber which was a, a substance that could not be picked up either as liquid or by metal detectors. We find Abdul Muttalib, what do they do? 
they go to putting a bomb in the uh, compartment, uh, the, the baggage compartment, the, the, the cartridge bomb plot. And I've even heard, I think this has been in the press, that, that they've even thought of surgically implanting yeah. a weapon. Yeah. So they're thinking ahead. And we, we try, but I think we continue to lag. Um, we just, it's just in our nature to, but this is one, with one reason why at the agency, right after 9-11, we created something called the Red Cell, and their job was, uh, Steve will remember this very well, their, their job, and, and you gathered all the, the most uh, innovative, eccentric people you could find in the agency, put them in a room and shoved food under the door once a day, <laughs> and said, you are now terrorists. Think like a terrorist. What would you do if you wanted to attack us? And uh, they came up with some really scary ideas. And some of them were true. Uh, but that, we have to be them in order to anticipate what uh, they might do. So we have not been talking about ISIS yet, and we soon will be. Um, but coming back to AQAP, which we were beginning to talk about a moment ago, um, we, we've had some ups and downs there. I'd like to hear some thoughts on what the current state of the AQAP threat is. While we've been busily focusing uh, the national attention on ISIS, what's been happening in Yemen and where are we right now? Uh, Dan, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, I think uh, Mike will probably have a more up-to-date uh, view. I did want to say about AQAP, uh, first of all, that it, while it was true that it uh, announced itself in 2009, uh, it wasn't like uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, de novo. It didn't come out of thin air. I mean, Al-Qaeda had, op had operations in Yemen going back to the early 90s, and according to some histories, it was uh, the site of the very first uh, uh, Al-Qaeda attempt when they tried to uh, attack uh, U.S. troops transiting um, Aden, I believe, coming out of, out of Somalia. So, you know, it was a group that had... Uh, had a track record already, and I think that um, they did engage in some rebranding in 2009. Uh, but it is a you know diabolically clever group. It is one that we really need to worry about a lot, and it is one that right now is is uh, in classic uh, terrorist fashion, benefiting from uh, the uh, conflict uh, in Yemen. I mean, wherever you find a conflict, you seem to find terrorist groups that are uh, making the best of the chaos and. Uh, uh, building up their, their capabilities, their ranks, uh, and uh, their plans. I guess one of the really interesting things about, and by the way, QAP, I think right now, is actually controlling a fair bit of territory in Yemen, which is not widely known, uh, in the Hadramaut, um, in, the, uh, in the southeast of the country. So, uh, or maybe it's the northeast of the country. But, um, you know, we definitely need to worry about about them, and as we have seen now that there's a competition going on between uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates, uh, as we saw in Mali, and, uh, and ISIS affiliates, uh, the possibility grows that AQAP may want to uh, re sort of revitalize the, uh, the Al-Qaeda brand by uh, striking, and by striking against uh, the far enemy. They haven't abjured their, their uh, strategic orientation. One of the interesting questions right now about AQAP is whether under pressure from ISIS and with the uh, fight going on against the Houthis, whether they will seek to um, strengthen their attraction to Sunnis uh, by, by uh, attacking uh, Houthis more, that is to say, uh, becoming more uh, fervently sectarian. Um, and that is, that is something that is uh, interesting and worth watching. Uh, it, it will have some implications for our, our policy, um, but I think for now it's pretty clear the AQAP remains a very, very dangerous, uh, certainly technologically, the, you know, the, the front of the pack uh, from, uh, of the terrorist uh, organizations. Yeah, and I, I would add to that, uh, you know, they've got the world's greatest bomb maker, uh, Ibrahim al Siri, who's invented a lot of the uh, bombs that um, John uh, talked about. Uh, you know, so we had the 2009 uh, plot uh, of the Matalab, and then 2012. Um, they also represent a significant um, uh, local threat to us. We had a very, very serious threat against our embassy uh, in 2000, summer of th 2013 that we were able to disrupt, but uh, at a lot of effort. 2009, too. And 2009 <laughs> as well. And, um, you know, 
in 2011 as uh, Arab Spring, or maybe better known as Al-Qaeda Spring, um, uh, expanded across the Arab world, AQAP gained a lot of adherence and a lot of territory. We beat that back a bit uh, through 2012. Uh, uh, and then after the um, uh, Houthi takeover, they had been focused on um, rallying in the uh, south and some of the hinterlands of uh, Yemen. But as Dan mentioned, um, they're doing reasonably well and consolidating now. And so the danger is, is, is very much uh, increasing from that group. What does this special technical capacity and, and efficacy that AQAP seems to have, what does it mean for other groups, especially groups in Africa, ranging from al-Shabaab to others? Is What's the connection, if any, there? And, and what does it tell us about the nature of the larger network? Um, the connection is tightest. Um, Yemen and Somalia, because they abut each other, there's movement of people and connection, but the, the high-end connections, the, the head of AQAP who we killed recently, uh, Waishi, uh, and was Zawahiri's designated successor, um, they are closest to core Al-Qaeda core and then to Al-Qaeda in Syria. The other groups, as you get further away from that, um, still may have allegiance, but they're generally more focused on local targets, and they don't share the technologies as much. It's really in that core cluster. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? I, I would just say that, you know, al-Shabaab is back on its heels uh, and, um, you know, is resorting to more terrorist attacks of a fairly uh, crude nature, or at least simple nature, uh, in order to keep itself uh, in the headlines and to, you know, sort of, you know, there's a political economy to terrorism. You've got to be doing stuff if you want to attract money and you want to attract recruits. So they're carrying out terrorist attacks like we saw in the Westgate Mall, uh, but they have not to date shown the kind of technical uh, prowess that AQAP has, has shown. So, so here we have AQAP holding territory, having a safe haven in, in certain areas amidst a larger internal conflict. Uh, is this situation analogous to Al-Qaeda core pre-9-11, where we know it's a problem, we're doing things, we're doing some fairly dramatic things, but there's not a realistic political and diplomatic context to do anything much more dramatic, and no one really demanding that we do. But one outrageous provocation later, suddenly it seems obvious that, of course, we do a, a full-fledged invasion. Is, is that a proper way to think about AQAP today? No, I mean, I, I would say the difference between 9-11 is one, on the one hand, as John mentioned, they continue to innovate, and so they have technologies that weren't available to Al-Qaeda then, but also they are under more pressure. You know, Al-Qaeda pre-9-11 was really not bothered much at all, and, and, and we could do a lot more against AQAP than we're doing, and we do it episodically, but, um, but they are under pr some pressure. Okay, well... We've, uh, there's an elephant in the room we've not dwelt with, dealt with, and that's uh, ISIS, of course, um, which originates with AQI, which at one point it seemed that AQI had been fairly well suppressed. Why did it revive? What were the, the trends and factors that led it to, to reemerge as the potent force it was, and then to transform into ISIS? Who would like to start with that? I'll start from a simplistic sense. Um, I think that when we started uh, looking at the, the, the terrorist threats and you look at it uh, worldwide or, or any area that you want to talk about, I remember an early analogy was it's like looking at a balloon and if you put pressure on one area, it's just going to bulge out in another area unless you keep that pressure all the way around. So as with any organization, if the pressure starts to come off, if you focus on something else, they've got that opportunity to um, rearm and re-equip, for lack of a better term. Um, and, and every nation has got to look at the resource-constrained environment. You've got to look at the priorities. You've got to look at the risk that you feel. In doing all those calculus, we removed uh, the pressure, um, the holistic pressure that uh, is applied to one area to apply it someplace else, um, notwithstanding uh, certainly what the agency is doing uh, worldwide right now and as they're looking at everything, it all depends on the national will and what the nation determines is the highest risk and do they want to take the steps that would be recommended to them to take but in fact may not um, may not be in the senior leadership calculus at the time. 
Yeah, if I were to go to like 30,000 feet on that issue, I, I think we have to realize there were some uh, huge geopolitical muscle movements going on in this period of time. First, uh, there are three big trends that uh, a number of us talked about in writing back in 2012, 2013. Uh, first, uh, it was apparent when we made the decisions that we were going to ramp down our presence in Afghanistan and Iraq, that there would be a vacuum of sorts created. It seemed apparent to me, you have, if, if you still have the problem, you're gonna have fewer eyes on the problem and diminished intelligence reporting because you're not gonna have people out all over these two countries. Uh, so you, you, that, that's one thing. Second thing is the Arab Spring occurs and a number of things happen. Um, as Henry Kissinger said at the beginning of the Arab Spring, this is scene one of act one of a five-act play. And uh, I don't know what scene we're in now, but we're not at the end of the play. But in that first uh, couple of years, it, it goes to what we quickly saw, which is um, the Arab Spring turns into, in most cases except perhaps Tunisia, uh, a series of revolutions that do two things. First, it disrupts the security apparatus of these countries. Okay, authoritarian countries have their, their downsides, of course. We don't, we don't love the word authoritarianism. But authoritarian countries with intelligence services generally know what's going on on the street. That, the confusion and chaos in, across the Middle East due to the uh, changes in government uh, opened up uh, valleys of ignorance about what's going on in those countries. The intelligence services themselves became focused on other things like surviving in transitional governments. And uh, in that period of time, and I said we're at 30,000 feet, I'm not really even talking about just Iraq, but across this whole area, South Asia, Middle East, North Africa, going back to your very first question, uh, uh, Bobby, uh, about safe havens, we see in this period of time the emergence of the largest safe haven that terrorists have had since prior to 9-11. That was plainly apparent. A, uh, uh, ISIS emerges in that general climate. The third big trend is uh, more precise. I won't go into it deeply, but I think in this period of time we start to pick up evidence that terrorists are thinking more about holding territory. You see this in documents captured in um, Mali when the French go in, uh, where the group that was taking over and repelled by the French are saying things to their commanders like the leader is saying to their commanders look, we have to think about holding territory and treating people differently, and we can't just come in and run roughshod over everything. They're starting to think in those terms. So AQ, it's in that atmosphere, uh, particularly when Syria's Arab Spring goes bad real fast, and it's apparent that uh, Assad is going to put down that movement in a brutal way, and that Sunnis, 70% of Syria, are suffering that becomes a magnet for foreign fighters, and uh, AQI, then AQI, uh, transforms into uh, ISIS uh, and exploits that uh, more effectively than any other group, including the remnants of Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and so forth, that were in Syria. So those are the big trends that I think uh, ISIS was riding in this period. Dan? So I would add one more uh, big trend and that is sectarianism, which um, has been a factor, uh, well, it's been a factor in Islam in one way or another for 1,400 years, uh, but it has, you know, it has uh, oscillated in, in, in dramatic fashion. But uh, it starts up um, again with the Islamic Revolution in 1979. And, uh, you know, up to that point, the Shah of Iran and, and uh, the... Um, the House of al-Saud had, had rubbed along uh, well enough, uh, but the Islamic Revolution changes everything, and Iran is claiming global leadership of uh, the Ummah, of, of, uh, of all of Islam. And as a result, um, uh, the Saudis begin a very aggressive uh, program of what they call dawah, which is outreach and preaching. And as a result, we see this proliferation of Wahhabi institutions, of uh, money going to uh, all kinds of religious foundations around the world, itinerant preachers, curricular materials, what have you, in an effort to really 
it's kind of a counter-reformation against, uh, against the Iranians. So that goes on, you know, in, again, not in, a, not, not in a steady state, but it goes on, it's up and down until, into, the, into the 90s. Um, and then I think that it sort of subsides a bit, but what happens in 2003 is that we disturb the ecosystem in a pretty serious way. So when the United States displaced a Sunni autocrat, dictator, uh, and you know, truly evil man in Baghdad, and the Shia uh, majority uh, is able to, in the new democratic dispensation, uh, take power, uh, this throws the Sunni world uh, really out of joint. And, uh, you know, for example, even though it's a new democratic country that's uh, under the tutelage of the United States, we can't get the Saudis to even send an ambassador there. Uh, and, um, and, and the Sunnis, especially the Gulf Arabs, are looking at this development with great suspicion. Uh, fast forward to the uh, Syrian rebellion, and I think that the uh, Sunni leadership uh, in Saudi and Qatar in, in a number of places sees this as an opportunity to even the score. So instead of having um, a rather rapid uh, either success or crushing of rebellion in Syria, uh, we get to a point where uh, the Shia are piling on more. Iran and Hezbollah are coming to the aid of uh, Bashar al-Assad. He's an Alawite. He's not exactly a Shia, but he's been, but Alawites have been recognized as Shia by the uh, uh, Iranian uh, um, clerical establishment. And the Sunnis are uh, then pouring in more and more money to fight them. And uh, so, you know, every, it seems like every few months we're reaching a new equilibrium of violence and more and more people are dying. And sectarianism across the region is rising as a result. And it's against this backdrop that uh, Zarqawi uh, makes his big innovation, his strategic innovation, which is he sees that uh, uh, this is an opportunity uh, effectively to put bin Laden's, uh, to his mind, I think, uh, far too elaborate strategy behind him uh, and to simply grab uh, a state out of the heart of uh, Iraq and Syria by capitalizing on Sunni Shia uh, antipathies and by um, essentially trying to foment a civil war in, uh, in Iraq. And, you know, Zarqawi is, is a fascinating figure because he's a complete thug. But he's so uh, brilliant uh, intuitively, I think, at, at strategy uh, that even when we crush AQI the first time around and he gets killed in 2006, that dream lives on. And, and in the scenario that John described where the Syrian civil war provides an opportunity for AQI to recoup its losses, uh, they can come back with a vengeance and uh, really uh, rip apart uh, Iraq and create this enormous safe haven you know, from Anbar to the outskirts of Aleppo. And I think that that has to be understood as a major uh, factor in the developments we've seen and a major driver of extremism. Uh, remember, Zarqawi, you know, he hated us, uh, but boy, he hated the Shia more. And uh, that has continued to be uh, a, def you know, a real characteristic of ISIS. Yeah, one interesting point on that, um, uh, bin Laden and, and Al-Qaeda Corps really felt that Zarqawi was getting out of control uh, with the sectarian violence in 2004, and so they dispatched uh, an emissary to tell him to knock it off. Um, we captured that emissary, and that emissary was very key to um, leading the bin Laden and Abbottabad in 2011. So it's, it's always been easy to see how the rise of ISIS has presented a significant foreign policy problem for the United States and a regional disruptive threat. It's also always been easy to see how horrific they, they were and, and what a moral outrage their, their conduct has been. But if you go back a, a, about a year or so ago, what, what you heard some people saying was there's a question about to what extent are they themselves concerned with uh, the far enemy, the United States? To what extent is it like al-Qaeda where you expect them when given the chance to conduct out of area operations? We're no longer obviously in that world. It's very clear that they have moved into an out of, out of area operations phase. Why has this changed? Or is it simply it was always there and it just finally materialized in recent weeks? Bruce? Well, I don't, th I don't think it was a change. If uh, ISIS's ideology is not different at all from al-Qaeda's. The only differences are timing, when the caliphate can be declared under uh, 
uh, Al-Qaeda's strategy and Zawahiri's preferences. First, the Middle East had to be cleansed of infidel in influences and the apostate regimes had to be overthrown. Uh, Al-Baghdadi said, why wait? And I think being the egomaniac that he is, decided just to basically steal Al-Qaeda's lunch and steal the thunder. Um, the other debate was whether you would concentrate first on the near enemy and then move to the far enemy, or the far enemy first and then the near enemy. This is something that Al-Qaeda has always gone back and forth with. In ISIS's case, it chose to focus initially on the near enemy. But clearly, uh, as I said earlier, the, the proliferation of provinces or branches have internationalized it. But even it has had aspirations. Uh, FBI Director Comey spoke of a plot that was broken up uh, over the July 4th holiday that involved the arrest of 10 persons in the United States but was ISIS related. There have certainly been a raft of ISIS plots going back, I mean, very clearly, the beginning of this year. I mean, one of, I think, the frustrations of the Paris attacks is Abdul Hamid Aboud, the mastermind, had actually plotted an attack on January 15th uh, in Belgium, had then escaped, returned to, returned to Syria, came back to the European Union, was completely unnoticed, even by the French authorities that were looking, by, uh, looking for him. So they've always had these aspirations. There have already been arrests of ISIS operatives in the past year in Switzerland, in Kosovo, in Albania and numerous plots disrupted. It's just tragically last week, the, the, the first European plot came to fruition. Others? Well, I, I would just add that uh, to me it always seemed inevitable. There are all the ideological reasons why they would do this, but another reason is because they can. What do I mean by that? Well, they have, I won't go through a whole litany of things here, but they have at least five advantages, strengths that Al-Qaeda never had. Three of them are particularly important on this score. One is access. Al-Qaeda never had this kind of access to us. You, you all know the figures. Uh, uh, the uh, study that uh, Senator referred to yesterday uh, by uh, the Homeland Security Committee now puts the figure at 4,500 Western uh, fighters with them. That's people with Western passports, many of them with you know, the ability to move freely, as now you hear every day on television. Uh, some numbers of Americans, uncertain numbers, I hear anything from 100 to 250. Uh, so they have access that Al-Qaeda never had. Al-Qaeda was struggling to get people like that who could come here or go into Europe freely. Uh, second, they have money. You cannot underestimate the role of money here. Money allows you to buy expertise. You talk about innovative ideas, biology, information technology. Where do these slick videos come from? I think they've bought, they've bought expertise to do this. Um, and it allows you to travel. It allows you to buy weapons. It allows you to do all sorts of things. Al-Qaeda was always strapped for money. They were always scraping the bottom of the barrel. And third, uh, of course, uh, crucially, they have territory. They have a safe haven. Give terrorists a safe haven. I don't care. Give me any terrorist group in the world. Give them a safe haven, and they'll attack us. Yeah. So um, I, I, uh, I pretty much agree with everything that has been said. Um, but I'm wondering if they haven't accelerated or deepened their focus on out-of-area uh, attacks because of the problems they're having uh, in, the, in, in ISIS-controlled territory, in the, in the caliphate, if you will. Um, so the, you know, there are debates over how much the U. I think CENTCOM is saying that they've lost 25% of their territory. Um, if you listen to uh, Director Comey, the, the number of uh, people headed there is down, at least from the United States. And my guess is that uh, there's been some uh, dim diminution at the margins. Uh, I think their finances, uh, although they do have, uh, they do, uh, you know, dwarf anything Al Qaeda had. Their finances are becoming more, uh, a little more perilous because of the uh, attacks on oil infrastructure. And um, uh, there, you just hear more about more people who are leaving, and about more dissonant voices that are making it uh, into uh, into the Twitter sphere or wherever it is you're, you're listening. So I say this, um, we have a tendency to always uh, view our enemies as perhaps bigger than they are. And I think that we have to recognize that there may be other factors uh, at work here. That's not in any way an argument for complacency. Um, but um, it, it could well be that they decided that in order to 
uh, attract the recruits that they needed, that they needed to essentially diversify their por portfolio of attraction. So the caliphate itself, holding territory, creating a Muslim state that was supposed to be, harken back to the golden age of, uh, of early Islam, you know, worked incredibly. I mean, they were much wiser, I think, much shrewder, certainly, than uh, bin Laden had ever been about what was going to attract Muslims from around the world. And the fact that 30,000 or so people have migrated there is a testament to that and a testament to how he captured the imagination, especially uh, of young, uh, young Muslims. Uh, but I think that if there is any stress in that part of the uh, uh, ISIS world, then they're going to want to carry out traditional terrorist attacks in the West that may also uh, boost their popularity, and of course, if you looked at the response uh, immediately after Paris, you know, it was a big hit with uh, uh, those who were um, leaning towards extremism. D Dan may have a point here. There's a, there's a cycle in our knowledge and understanding of terrorism. Uh, the way, you know, in intelligence, you're always trying to dis discriminate between what do I know, what don't I know, and what do I think. And there's a there's a cycle in our knowledge of terrorism that may be operating here, at least personally. I always approach these things at this moment with a certain degree of humility about what we really know and understand. When terrorists sit still, you learn a lot about them and you gain great confidence in your understanding. When they start to move and when you start to attack them, you enter an area where your knowledge is very slippery of what's going on in their inner circles. And I think Dan has a point here we all should think about. I don't know that we fully understand at this point, uh, at least I certainly don't, uh, with confidence. How are they thinking? How strong are they? How are they reacting? Because now it's, we're in a dynamic phase. And um, I think we need to approach all of it with uh, a little humility and also be prepared for surprises of some sort. Yeah, I, I think the plot, um, the attack you saw in Paris recently was underway for some time. Um, you know, they're not 10 feet tall. I mean, it does take them a while to be able to get everything in place and, and, and do some of these attacks. And, um, you know, you just have to be vigilant. I mean, another thing Director Comey has said recently, you know, is they have 900 cases active in the United States right now in all 50 states. Now, you know, because Al uh, ISIS and also Al Qaeda have both adopted the, you know, uh, if you can't come and join us here, do something there, you know, the lone wolf attack. And so, uh, you know, just trying to appeal to people in place, like the Chattanooga shooting and, and, and others. So recruitment and inspiration matters a great deal. And ISIS famously has, has had a certain flair for it, particularly through social media. Um, Bruce, I, I wanted to ask you whether you thought there was much, if anything, realistically, the United States government could be doing, it's not already doing, to try to counteract the larger narrative and in, in so-called, uh, engage in the so-called war of ideas element here. Is, is this something that when the U.S. government speaks, then by definition, it won't work because it's us speaking? Well, I think with ISIS, it's, it's more complicated than that. And, you know, I don't see them as, despite uh, Baghdadi styling himself as the caliph and despite uh, claiming the establishment of, uh, of a religious state, I think that their appeal makes them very difficult to counter. And their appeal goes back to almost the classic appeal of France Fenon and the Wretched of the Earth in the 1950s. It's an appeal to people because of the catharsis of violence, the cleansing aspects of it, the satisfaction of striking a blow against a hated enemy. And one is to say just the attraction of violence almost on a pornographic scale. And those are, you know, those were enormously difficult messages to, uh, to counter. I mean, many of the people that are coming into, flowing into ISIS's ranks, at least from the West, are not particularly religiously devout people. I mean, quite to the contrary in many, in many respects. But they are attracted by this ability to come to the so-called utopia, to participate when there are religious uh, overtones in the coming apocalypse. And that's why uh, ISIS uh, calls its online magazine Dabiq, where supposedly this Armageddon will be fought. But it's the violence, and it's unfortunately the pornography of violence, and it's also raping, plundering, pillaging. I mean, all of that has, I think, transmitted through social media enhanced their appeal. And that's a tough narrative to counter. I think that's why yesterday, Adam McRaven was talking about, you know, a decade ago we may have thought every terrorism problem, you know, needed or that there was only a military solution to it. 
But in the case of ISIS these days, I think, is depriving them of that territory, depriving them of their status, such as Admiral McRaven was talking about yesterday, is probably going to be the main thing that will reduce their allure. I'm not sure that we can have an effective message given just, you know, there was a phenomenal article in the Wall Street Journal the other day that had, it must have been 40 different um, social media apps or methods that they use to communicate. And that from their own, uh, and, and we know this from, the, from their publications as well, it was just, it was, it was basically copying what was in, uh, in Dubique. Um, you know, rating them whether these are encrypted and very difficult to access or whether these are much more open, but they're so fluent, I think, with their use of social media and exploitation that it's very difficult for us at this stage to have an effective counter-narrative. That raises a question in my mind I wanted to ask about, to John about the intelligence game here. Um, last weekend after the Paris attacks, the, the hacker collective Anonymous proclaimed uh, Operation Paris. They were gonna go after all the social media accounts that they could, they could link to ISIS. And by Monday, there were, there were reports that some 5,500 accounts had been taken down. Uh, and my first reaction was to think, well, I'm glad to see Anonymous focusing their energies in that direction. My, my second reaction was, boy, that was pretty quick. A lot of accounts, I'm sure the US government could have done that. And then I, my third reaction was, and I suppose there may be a reason why they didn't, um, is there an advantage to having ISIS active accounts from an intelligence collective collection perspective to being able to monitor and see who's, who's in communication? Do you think that this is something where, to a certain extent, we don't want to silence all of their social media activity? Well, um, first off, I, I don't know precisely what we're doing, and if I did, I couldn't say. <laughs> but. Uh, I think uh, the way I would think about that, if, if posed to me, was uh, as with most choices in government and particularly in intelligence, uh, it's a tough choice. And, and you'd have to weigh the benefits and the deficits of each line of action. I think a case could be made that much of what we know about them comes from studying their social media intelligently. Uh, a lot of what we know about their casualties, about their... Um, about the foreign fighter population comes from studies that have been done in the academic world, looking at their social media, their martyrdom sites and all of that and comparing that with their propaganda. And uh, much of what we know about their governing style comes from comparing what they say they're doing in social media with what we, in, in their propaganda, with what we see in social media. And that's just in the open source. That's just what we do. I can imagine uh, that my former colleagues are all over this. And uh, why wouldn't they be? And so uh, on balance, I would say it depends on whether you're going on a real war footing with them or not. If you're going on a real war footing with them, I would say take them down. Take down their sites. Uh, go, go at them with every cyber tool you have while you're also going at them kinetically. If you're not on a war footing, I would say the advantages are greater to studying what they're doing. And in terms of countering them, as difficult as that is, I think the most effective thing we could do would be to counter them in social media, not with faces like mine or any faces up here, but with faces of people who have left them. And uh, I think Peter Newman, was it Peter Newman at uh, 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 King's College has done now a study of something like 240 uh, people who have left ISIS. I don't know how he had access to them and all of that. But those people, those are the faces that they need to see in their social media saying, here's what I, happened to me while I was there. Uh, I am a Muslim too. I bought it. It was a false story. Now, would they believe that? I don't know. I think that could be done effectively. Yeah, I mean, the, the challenge that the migration to social media poses is that it's harder to take them down than it would be if they were using a private uh, website or something. No, you know, you can still monitor. Um, the extra challenge that you have is when you combine um, the broad appeal or the broad reach of social media then with an encryption, where once I identify someone, then I can pull them offline, you know, then it, it complicates the problem. So John used the phrase war footing a moment ago, and, and it was notable that you phrased it as an open question. Are we on a war footing or are we not on a war footing? Um, Frank, from, from the military perspective, how would you answer that question, and, and what, if anything, differently should we be doing militarily about ISIS? Yeah, I, I think that's a, um, that is a huge question. Let me, let me answer that on, on a couple different levels. Um, 
you know, the question about are we at war, I think as we turn around and look at a definition of total war that our nation has known in the past, we have brought and continue to bring all elements of national power to bear. When you talk about all elements of national power, though, it, it's not the diplomatic, the information, the military, and the economic that we talk about. You've got to go down into multiple layers and levels. You've got to turn around and look at the opportunity to engage and reach out into think tanks. You've got to come out into universities. You've got to look at the ideas and understand culture. And, and so I would say I don't believe that we have tapped into every resource that we should, nor have we looked at the problem strategically. I mean, we emphasize the military cannot solve this mission. Military can buy you time. The military can disrupt. And the military can turn around and set the stage for other activities to engage. But as a nation, we need to look at the problem set, and we need to look at it in terms of a worldwide coalition. Um, I would contend that the refugee flow is one of the biggest challenges facing us, and we need to look at that from an all-of-government, all-of-nation, all-of-world approach. If you look at the refugee flow, we know that the terrorist elements come out because they're disaffected youth, and disaffected youth are disaffected because they enter into an environment that does not welcome them. They enter into something that is different, so when you bring a refugee in, you've already brought them into something that is different, and arguably, we've already heard that we would not be welcoming. And then the third, the, the, the third kind of broad area is that the youth do not have jobs. And it's important to note now, because you look at ISIS, I think I, I saw a study where one in seven recruits to ISIS are women. So we can't only talk about military age males. We've got to look at males and females, which poses another threat to us, by the way. But as we look at it, we're bringing in refugees into nations that have low uh, employment rates, so a high unemployment rate, I guess is the better way to say it. Have we looked at how do we negate that problem? And that to me is if we're at war, we need to be looking at every single layer and level of how do we address the problem today, but certainly for the future. Thoughts from others? Mike, is there something the military should be doing in Syria and Iraq that we're not yet doing? Yeah, so. Um um, you know, ISIS is a, are essentially a de facto state, as well as a global terrorist group. It holds territory, it controls population, it controls resources. If you look at the intensity of our campaign so far, um, in 16 months that we've been waging it in Iraq and Syria, and compare it to what we did in Afghanistan in 2001, it's about one-eighth the level of effort in intensity. And so it's not surprising that you know, we've attrited them somewhat. We've pushed them back a little bit, but, uh, but by and large, you know, the battlefield has remained reasonably stagnant. Two-thirds of our effort has been in Iraq, our strikes, measured by our strikes. Uh, the bigger problem is really in Syria. And then related to the Syria problem is, um, you know, Assad is this magnet. I mean, this is really the big policy question. Assad is this magnet for all these guys going in there. And so if you don't deal with the Assad problem and talked about earlier about, you know, Lebanese Hezbollah and the Iranians and on one side and, you know, Dan mentioned Turkey, Gutter and Saudi Arabia on the other side, you know, that's where the central fight of the Middle East is as well as in Syria. And so uh, we're, you know, we're scratching at that right now rather than, um, than yeah, in, in the sociology of policymaking, I think we're talking ourselves gradually into a war setting, a war footing. <laughs> I think that's what's going on. You know, if you went back a year or so, we weren't, we weren't going to put troops in. Then we put in 1,200. We weren't going to put in special operators. Now we're putting in 50. Uh, the, discussion now is, uh, the, the discussion now is centering almost everyone is saying, uh, not everyone, but a lot of people are saying, intensify the air campaign and give more serious thought to uh, the creating the safe zone. I, I wouldn't be surprised if within a month we start to see movement toward a safe zone. Uh, that would, to me, would be the most dramatic change, short of uh, ground forces, because it would force uh, a lot of effort and would be dangerous and risky and would uh, have to have coalition involvement, could be from NATO special forces, could be from uh, the Turks, uh, could be from some Arabs. It would be very difficult, but it would be a dramatic demonstration that, okay, we're serious about this now, in a way we haven't been before. 
recognizing all of the downsides of that. I think, I think that we need to have an open discussion about boots on the ground, too. I mean, there is such a spectrum there. Yeah. If you turn around and you look at, uh, it, it is a population-centric war. I would argue that one of the reasons why we have constrained ourselves, and we saw it when we dropped leaflets before we took out uh, a number of oil tanks, we're very concerned about the population, as we should. We're concerned about those casualties. So boots on the ground allows you somebody that you trust on the other side of that radio to be able to bring in air power that you need in order to exercise greater control, greater fidelity, um, and therefore greater precision. But it's still going to be messy. The other thing that boots on the ground do for you is allow forces in with the forces that you have trained, that you're supporting, and allows that constant assessment. How well are they doing? What do we need to focus on? Can we trust the intelligence that we're getting from them? Did they go and fight where we thought that they would? How well did they fight? And then finally, and, and this is uh, and, and tremendous men and women who would be out there doing it, but when you put a, a soldier, sailor, airman, marine out there in the force, people understand how the United States operates. They understand that when that person is with them that we are, there's going to be air power available to bring to bear against the enemies. We're not going to hang somebody out. There's going to be medical evacuation out there. There's going to be the ability to call in reinforcements because we're not just going to hang somebody out there. Um, it's not to say that we don't go very dangerous places. Don't, uh, that does not mean that we don't take some severe risks, but that is a morale booster for the forces that you're with. So if you are concerned about the operational capability of the force that you're going to be employed with, having somebody, coalition forces, NATO forces, whoever it is, having an outsider in with those forces and knowing that they can reach back and get additional help, additional aid, um, it oftentimes means that the results of those forces fighting is better than they may have been otherwise. You know, one of the big insights out of this conference for me was in the panel on stability operations. Because at the end of that panel, I found myself thinking, going back to the question General Petraeus asked years ago about another circumstance, how does this end? However this ends, if Mosul and Ramadi and Fallujah are ultimately liberated by some means, someone's got to be there. It's got to be Iraqis. It's got to be a coalition. It's got to be some external uh, body. As someone else said in one of the panels here, uh, these situations normally don't end well without international involvement. So we're far, far from having thought this thing through end to end. Dan? Yeah, um, just to draw a few of the things that have been uh, put on the table. I mean, I, I agree with the premise that um, damaging the Islamic State's territorial integrity, its, its viability as an entity, um, would have a very positive effect on, uh, from our perspective, on recruitment and on the attractiveness of the ISIS brand. Um, we were having a discussion over dinner the other night, and, and uh, John McLaughlin said something very interesting when he thought that, said that he thought his, his views on what we could achieve from the air uh, might be changing. And I think that that's really the area that we need to look at very hard now, is, is we do need to intensify uh, as, as Mike has suggested, uh, but how we intensify is going to be really uh, important because we don't have that follow-on force that's going to police the uh, ground. And what's more is there isn't one in sight. Um, yeah. All of our putative partners, with the exception, I would say, of the Jordanians in the Muslim world, are otherwise engaged. They're still doing their counter-Iran, counter-Shia thing, uh, and they, are, they view extremism as a secondary concern, one that they will deal with later. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, with our troops plunked down in uh, Iraq. We took serious uh, casualties, you know, nearly roughly 4,500 dead. And uh, we paid trillions of dollars, you know, trillions of dollars in that. And I think we have to think long and hard how long we want to uh, be plunked down again in that. Uh, desert. I think there is a lot of um, a lot of reason, a lot of sense in the notion that it is uh, the neighborhood that will need to ultimately police this. I share Admiral McRaven's view that uh, U.S. leadership will be critical uh, to dealing with this. 
Um, but I would also emphasize, as we think about what we're going to do going forward, that we also have to think about defense as well as offense. Now, remember, we have not suffered, thank God, a major attack by ISIS uh, in the United States. And we haven't suffered that uh, in part because um, uh, we have much better border controls, we have much better intelligence and law enforcement than our partners in Europe. They need to invest heavily in, in that area. We can help them, uh, not financially, but certainly logistically and, and uh, technically. And uh, we will benefit enormously if ISIS finds it harder and harder to carry out an attack. Every war is part offense and part defense, and I think we need to think very hard about both parts. I would also add that our Muslim community in the United States uh, has been less radicalized, less attracted to ISIS, uh, and is less prone to violent extremism than what we see in Europe, where the Muslim communities are more ghettoized, uh, less educated, higher unemployment, uh, lower incomes. And uh, so these are all facts, I think, that we need to uh, keep in mind as we plot our own strategy going forward. There's little doubt that we could continue this discussion. We've really only scratched the surface. I had, I had wanted to, to ask Bruce to say a few words about his recent very striking article about how we need to not lose sight of Al-Qaeda in the long-term game, that it is still out there playing. Um, however, before I ask you to applaud our panel, I want to note that we're going to, we're going to ask you guys to please stay in place. We're not breaking. Uh, we will very, in, in a few moments, be hearing from Senator John Cornyn. So I will ask you now to applaud the panel, but, but don't get up and go anywhere. It's just getting started. Thank you very much.